I'm Nurse Jessica Seitz, along with Nurse Erica. We're Nurses Uncorked, the podcast that takes nursing facts with nursing comedy and makes a little cocktail out of it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Nurses Uncorked. Uh, This is Nurse Jessica Seitz, your host, along with my co-host, Nurse Erica, the lovely Nurse Erica. And we have a special guest with us today that I'm super excited about. So without saying who he is, I'm going to give a little intro and see if you guys can figure out who we have on today. Um, This gentleman is a world-renowned psychic medium, stars of such hit TV shows as Crossing Over and John Edward Cross Country, Um, a New York Times bestselling author of many books. I hope I've done my homework good here, Um, has uh, read for many celebrities, um, has sat down with Oprah, Kim Kardashian, uh, just to say the least, and in my mind is one of the most accomplished and amazing psychic mediums ever of all time, and I am so excited and thankful to have John Edward on our podcast today. Thank you, John, for joining us. How was that intro, Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> that was amazing, Jessica, Erica. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I, 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 I'm very happy to be here and and listen to the conversation and be a part of it. And I come out of healthcare, so this feels like I'm coming home. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we know love that, that you have a background what... in healthcare. Phlebotomy, right? I did. Well, so while I was getting, I was in an accelerated program for getting a master's degree, where it was like a hybrid of doing your bachelor's and your master's for healthcare and public administration. Um, okay. And I decided that I wanted to, you know, get my foot in the door of the hospital. And I started working as a phlebotomist in the lab. Loved it. Absolutely loved the patient care. And then came the decision, like, I got to make this transition into administration. So I moved over to another department that was more admin and then moved into the IT department and absolutely hated it. Like right. I missed the <laughs> I course. missed the patient interaction um in such a such a big way. But yeah, my background is, is in healthcare. So it's like my behind the scenes passion. And you know, during the pandemic when I was expressing concerns about people's health and safety and well being and kind of a hybrid of my intuitive side meaning my my logical trained side, I had a lot of people telling me, like, you know, you need to stay in your lane and just like you know, you just talk to dead people. And um, people got a chance to see a very different side of me where I was <laughs> not as spiritual as one might might gather because I started amplifying and kind of trying to help boost some of the uh, folks that were trying to raise awareness when it came to healthcare. I've heard some of those. Uh, in fact, you did a podcast uh, at the beginning of the year for New Year's and you made some 2023 predictions that were spot on. And really kind of centered on healthcare workers, which we so appreciate. Yes. I, uh, I know that. you said COVID is not over. This was 10 nope. months ago. You made that prediction. Yep. And you said nurses and healthcare workers are rising up. We're not going to mm-hmm. take care of 50 patients anymore. It's all about the number of patients and that we will eventually win because we're putting humanity first. I can't tell you how much I love that. And you're absolutely right. We have seen an unprecedented amount of nursing strikes, for example. We are rising up. And I, I hope that your latter prediction is true with putting humanity first. I think that's the need. And you're, you're referring to the Maria Menounos podcast that I did yes. in January. And I literally, Erica, just said the other day, I go, wow, it's like, I'm surprised people haven't brought up some of the stuff that I had said. Not that I was not from an egotistical standpoint, but just like from a, like, this is ha- like happened, like it's happening. You know, I said it was going to be a year of accountability and I feel like people in the world of celebrity are also being held accountable in various different places. Like people don't care about your Louis Vuitton bag or your, you know, fashion right. show, or they don't really care about the the things that they did because we're having real everyday humanity type issues that are taking place. So thank you. Thank you for actually saying that. And um, I, I do believe that we have to put humanity first. And that's where that was coming from. Yeah, I was very impressed with that. You also said don't fall for the empathy manipulation, which is a term that I use all the time when I'm coaching nurses, because that is actually something that we are accosted with on a daily basis, the empathy manipulation. I love yeah, that so- you get it. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I, I experienced it, so I completely understand. I I used to suffer, so I'll 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 take the two worlds and bring it together. Um, I suffered from strep throat throughout my childhood. I mean, it was a ongoing thing that strep throat was something that was a really big deal for me. And they didn't know why. They were trying to figure out why did he keep getting this? Like, where was this coming from? Should we take his tonsils? Should we not take his tonsils? And, you know, Pen VK 500 was like, you know, it was like, here's your script. Like, this was how it would go. When I was working in the hospital, the lab manager at the time was a woman named Marianne. And she said, you know, I, I feel like it's important that we get them out. She says, because you're always struggling with this. She goes, so you come in in the morning, do the morning rounds. She says that I'll walk you over to day op. She says, and you can then, you know, you can get the tonsils out in day op. Just like and that. I looked at her ju- just like that. But <laughs> wow. the level of, the <laughs> level of, I need you to do the six and seven o'clock blood draws first. <laughs> and then we'll, oh, then we'll get oh, you course. over to day op. Was it, like the priority was making sure, cause I was fast. So mm-hmm. it was like taking me out of the rotation would be bad. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, no, I think I'm going to keep my tonsils, but thank you for your compassion. Like, you know, I'm, thank you I'm for that. I'm surprised they even wanted to give you the time to do that. Normally they'd yeah. get, hang made, in there, hang in there. I made the, yeah, I made the joke Wait and I was like, so, off. Mm-hmm. yeah, I was like, do you want me to come back for 1600 or 1800 rounds? Or like, am I good? Can I go home after the, after I, after I get my tonsils? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Kept them by the way. But psychically, um, this is the area, your throat chakra is where actually clear audience comes in it's where information that you're getting psychically can come in and when i met a a medium by the name of robert brown who's from london and he said to me he goes oh he goes you're very clear audience and i went i am he goes one of those strep throats must have been a bitch for you growing up and i was like that's crazy yeah i i had that i got my tonsils out actually um in my early 30s finally because Mm. i just it it continued for me. I was always either, they would say between strep throat or tonsillitis. That was constantly my two diagnoses all the time. But back then they were so hesitant to take your tonsils out. Like they really, you know, they, they wanted to keep them in there to help fight off infection, which obviously it wasn't doing, but um, yeah, yeah, I can totally relate with that for sure. I think that what healthcare workers have had, had to go through before the pandemic, you know, working short or whatever the case may be, creating the energy of if you call out you're 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 hurting your fellow coworker if you call out you're you're hurting your patient mm-hmm. um i i always remember thinking well hire more nurses like it's so hire, simple hire other pay like, them appropriately make it safe and you will have all the nurses you need but you have to be willing to pay for the nurses well, and now in my world, when I'm doing a reading for somebody and I get a certain feeling about energy, I call it the teaching, the teaching healing vibration. And a person who is a nurse or a person who is a teacher to me feels the same way because they're giving so much of themselves to somebody else. And I find it interesting that both of those fields are the most underpaid and they're giving the most of their time to help another person for the betterment of humanity. And the female dominated professions that have been just kind of systematically victimized right over the years we have a lot in common nurses and teachers actually yeah it, truly yeah well i think i wanted i, I wanted to em- i was gonna say we're empathetic like we take on people's feelings and that's draining yeah. like we, we constantly are feeling how they feel at least that is what i dealt with like you know i would always feel like they must be so sad right now or this must be so stressful <laughs> on them so it's constantly like feeling how they're feeling and it's on top of being stressed yourself, and it's at the end of the day, you're just exhausted. I mean, mentally, physically, just zapped. So it's tough. It can be tough yeah. for sure. If you will indulge me for a moment sure. to fangirl just very briefly, uh, I, I'm one of your OGs. <laughs> so <laughs> OG uh, for the two or three people, yep, the two or three people in the world that may not know who you are. Um, these days, you know, there's psychic mediums everywhere, but back in 2000, you were the pioneer. You were the first one to have a TV show syndicated worldwide crossing over with John Edward. And I have been a loyal follower since then the books, the show, everything. I've even seen, uh, one of your live shows when you came to Las Vegas back in 2019. And I wanted to share a story with you because I've always wondered if you knew what had happened at your show. So uh, one, 
I know because I haven't told her. I just told her that I had a, a story I wanted to share with you. So uh, one year prior to your show, spring break 2018, four Las Vegas teenagers drove to California for spring break, Huntington Beach. They were hit head on by a drunk driver and pushed into oncoming traffic, and three of them died instantly. The other one was seriously injured. Mm. Fast forward one year. We are at your show. Uh, And as you can imagine, that kind of devastated the Las Vegas community, right? To have four teens like that all at once. So you're doing your readings. And towards the beginning of the show, you call on someone that's like back left of the audience. And you say something about, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, you lost someone too young, too young, a, a son and I'm getting a car accident and, you know, no one thinks anything of it, but you can tell that these are probably the parents and they're emotional and nodding and yes, 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 yes. 30 minutes later, whenever you call on someone else in the audience, front, right, nowhere near each other. Very similar. Something similar to the one over there. I'm I'm getting um, something like that, that, you know, car accident, too young, um, uh, that maybe, maybe it was multiple and it started coming together. And then there was a third and there was an oh audible gasp God. in the audience because the locals, I think, immediately recognized what was going on, but none of those people, I, I think it was apparent, knew that the others were there, the other parents. I have goosebumps. And it was all this day, like... aha moment. My daughter and wow. I were there and I I we didn't know any of these these poor kids or their families, but as I said it devastated the community. And there was this audible gasp where we all went Oh my god. Like they're it all three, here. It seems like all three of no them No one came knew that they were here and you totally got it. You put wow. it all oh, together. Wow. Yeah. That's that's crazy and and beautiful in a tragic way. Yeah. Yes. That, that 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 would actually take place. It 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 reminds me. I was in Brisbane, Australia, <clears throat> and we're going back probably about a decade. There were two thousand people in this venue, and the venue I always loved working at this specific place because it was set up just like Crossing Over, where it felt like the, the bleachers kind of like went up like that. And I made a connection with somebody who had passed in a car accident, and the girl that was coming through was telling her parents that she she didn't pass alone, that there was a phenomenal paramedic who was with her the whole time, talking to her the whole time, listening to the whole time. And she wanted to say thank you to the paramedic. And can mom and dad let the paramedic know that she really appreciated her 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 exit being so compassionate. So mm-hmm. mom and dad were very, very emotional. And mom, they said, we don't know who it is. We, we wouldn't be able to do that. So I said, well, well, maybe there's a way, like maybe you can ask the hospital or ask whatever, and you can go that direction. And then I got pulled like a little bit back to my, you know, like a few rows back to the left. And I said, somebody else here is connected to them. I go, do you guys know each other? And the person like raised their hands, like they got the mic to them and said, I'm the paramedic. Oh my gosh. Wow. So it happened at the event yeah. and there was this like moment, which you're describing and everybody in the room feels it. It's this yeah. just moment of like, whoa, you know, like yeah. just, whoa. And then that to me just shows me how there's just this a like, bigger kind of organization of what takes place in the universe and nothing happens by chance or coincidence. And most importantly, like, what can we learn from these moments when it happens? Like, and there's multiple things I think that we can learn you know, about connection and about survival of consciousness and that, you know, we go on, but that's the, that's the other side of it. But what about the, this side of it? Like, well, what do we do? What do we do with that? Right? Like, how do we evolve through that? So we look at the validations that come in during the reading to help support the fact that there's a survival of consciousness. That's powerful, Erica. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, because I don't know these stories. Like, I don't, I don't remember them. I don't You wouldn't, if you weren't in Las Vegas, you wouldn't have known. That's amazing. I've always um, wondered reg- if you really knew 
And I wanted to share that now with you he because does. it was powerful. And <laughs> I think it was very healing. It was apparent that it was very healing for all of them. Or I'm telling yeah, you, you know, the goosebumps everywhere when you told me that. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, yeah. oh my. After so many years of doing this, like this is now my 38th year of doing this. Like this is a long time. Wow. They, they're, I, I come from an old school when it comes to the subject matter. And old school of doing this is you get in, you do your job, you get out. You don't have a connection to the client. Um, social media kind of knocks down that wall a little bit where you are able to interact with people that you've read, where they can show you validations or tell you stuff after the fact. And um, it's still a, I, I have the old school mentality where it's kind of like, I have to tell people, please don't volunteer. Thank you for trusting me, but please don't volunteer information because you may trust me and, and right. I've earned your trust and thank you. But the 400 people who have created knockoff accounts who are going to read that and, you know, now try to come at you and scam you out of money, they're, they're, you can't trust them. So it's a very interesting world that we're now living in because so much of the internet is amazing regarding community and so much of it is dangerous regarding community. We got to be careful. Absolutely. Jessica, I think I cut you off earlier. You were going to say something. It's okay. I'm just in enjoying the podcast. <laughs> Great time. <laughs> um, I was just going to talk about one story that you shared that um, I had a little bit of a question about, but it went back to your phlebotomy days back in, I think mm -hmm. it was 1990. And I love this story that you um, I saw it on TikTok actually, but it was the one where they tried to keep you out of the room because the patient would remind you of your mom that had passed. And yep. um, I, I hear a lot of you talking, well, for those that don't know, basically without going into, you know, too much time, but, you know, John did end up having to go into the room to draw labs on a patient that um, did put him back into a space that reminded him a lot of what, what his mom had gone through when when she was passing from cancer, which, you know, obviously <clears throat> was difficult and had to draw her labs and whatnot. But I, I believe that you were at least comforted, even though you had to poke the woman, you were like, well, at least they're letting her son stay, you know, yep. um, the night. And you were like, that's really nice of them. It's after hours, um, you know, and as much as you were kind of disheartened that you did have to draw labs because you knew she was probably going to pass pretty soon. Um, you told the nurse that at least, at least he's there. At least, you know, she's, she's got somebody. And that's when um, you guys had the realization or she told you that, no, there's nobody in the room. <laughs> nobody in the room. Now, my question to you is I hear a lot of you saying about when you tune in or, or when you get these um, frequencies, maybe as you describe it, or like you're having to up, your level and they're mm -hmm. having to bring theirs down where you can kind of meet in the middle. Cause I've listened to a lot of that. How often do you visually see something like that? Is it, is it actually a visual phenomenon? Like, and, and I, I just don't hear you talk about it that much. Is it like a rare thing or I just want you to elaborate a little bit. I'm sure. On that. So in the beginning of my development, there would be moments where I would see things and they, I would see them in a flash or I would see them quickly or I would see them peripherally. And it takes a lot of their energy to lower their frequency to be able to do that. Once the development process kicked in and my other abilities kind of picked up and did some of the heavy lifting, that aspect of it went away. So I, I don't see people like that now. I don't see that in the way, but I wasn't reading that day and it wasn't something that I was expecting to do. And I think because of the woman and the way she looked in the bed, because it really looked, she looked like my mom. Um, and it was less than a year that my mom had passed. I, I opened up emotionally. Uh -huh. And because I opened up emotionally, I connected with the family. So indirectly, I made a connection with the woman's energy. And it was more uh, an anger connection, you know, because I didn't understand why they were drawing blood on this woman. I didn't understand why every four hours or whatever it was that she was having blood work drawn. Like, yeah, not that I'm a doctor, not that I could, not that I can make that call, but you know, that that was an insurance thing. That wasn't a, that, that wasn't a, that wasn't a, we need this result thing. It was more like right. until the doctor DC, the orders, they were going to, you were going to, had you had to do that. So when I, when I walked in and I saw her, it just was like, she had no vein. It's just, she was like, so, yeah. so, so thin. But sitting in the chair, I really peripherally saw what looked like a 17-year-old. And I was only now 20 at the time. Wow. So I kind of felt like, 
dude, like I, I'm like a little ahead of where you're at. Like, that's what I wanted to say to him. Would never say that because I wouldn't yeah. want to get in trouble. But I thought it, you know, and then I felt like that it was cool that they let him stay because it was after hours, it was late. And the nurse looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. And she said that there was nobody else in the room. And wow. I said, well, then he must have walked into the bathroom. And she said, I did. And I emptied the Foley by the bed by the window. And I was like, and then when the two of us were standing in the hallway and we like looked down the hallway and the fire doors were closed that night and they're heavy. So if somebody had walked through them, they'd still be moving. And right. she just like, you know, did that whole like Twilight Zone music thing. And, you know, <laughs> she, you know. Nurse, she just like laughed and just walked away from me. And um, yeah. she's like, "What?" The next it's morning, weird at all. And she was, yeah, she was like, "Yeah, okay, like you know, I've got like twenty other patients I got to go to now." Right. So then she she like was there back early the next morning. So now I worked at six in the morning. Her shift started at seven, so she was there at like six thirty. The woman had passed, and um, yeah. I was able to talk to the daughter, and it was kind of a it was a moment. That yeah. would be such a full circle if you could ever connect with her again, like to see if she, the if the daughter ever did realize who you became to be. Like, because at that point, you you were working as a phlebotomist, you know, I wonder if she ever correlated that. That that story. No, I had another story that that happened with where I was having to draw a uh, typing cross on a patient that was going for surgery. And it was a heart surgery that she was going for. And it was a young kid. So when I went to go draw the, the blood, I psychically saw a, at the time, I know the two colors might have changed, but at the time it was a blue top tube, which would have been a PT, PTT to draw somebody's like levels of like what they could right. come in or heparin. So for me to see that, I was like, they want me to ch check that. So I actually oh. drew the blood. Oh, it wasn't ordered, to, but you went ahead ordered. and did it. Okay. I drew the blood. I ran down to the laboratory. I added the blood as if it was added by the doctor. Then I ran to the hematology supervisor and I was like, this needs to be run stat. And she's like, I can't. I'm like, no, you have to. They're going for surgery. So she ran it stat. I took the, the blood work results, ran back up to the cardiothoracic surgical assistant. Wow. And I was like, I said, hey, Charlene, I think you need to look at this. And she looked at it and she went, she can't have surgery. She'll bleed out on the table. Oh I was like, God. oh, really? And she was like, yeah. And the surgery got canceled. Wow. So it became a little bit of an issue because nobody was really sure how it actually happened. And I kept my ass like, I kept my mouth completely shut. And then years later, I was doing a reading for someone. And that story came up in the, in the reading. And I'm starting to give it to the person. I go, and then this happened? And they went, yeah. Which is, by the way, very normal because I'll see a lot of my own personal experiences in order to convey a message. Mm -hmm. And then I gave... I gave it like down to the specifics to who the doctor was and who the patient was. And the woman that I was reading went, oh, my God, I heard you were good. She's like, but this is like off the hook. <laughs> and I was like, I need, to, I'm like, I need to tell you that last, part's, that last part wasn't being psychic. And she goes, what? I go, I'm the one who did it. And she's like, what? I go, I'm the one who did it. And your daughter is telling me she's the one who told me to do it. And it happened to be her, the woman that I was reading, daughter's friend. Wow. wow. Yep. That, that's beyond coincidence. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, talk no. about a full circle moment there. Like it was just... kind of cool. That to me was one of those moments where I was like, wow, that's really awesome. Yeah. And thank I'm, God I'm sure I you had a lot of those. Wow. So one question that I am uh, dying to ask you, no pun intended. Um, why do... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jessica's gonna spit Sorry, out her that soda. Was funny. That was funny. That was a good one. I'm usually the comedian. Okay, go ahead. I know. Go Every ahead. Once in a rare while. Um, why is it that because this is something that I have struggled with for a long time? Why is it that some loved ones that have passed just don't seem to ever come through, no matter how open you are to it or need it? No matter how many psychic mediums you go to. <laughs> right. Why, why th would that I think be? It, I think it has to do, I think there's a lot of variables. One of the variables is that you had a good relationship with the person. And when you have a good relationship with the person, I think they're a little bit lazier. I mean, I say that like publicly all the time. Like, I think that they don't work as hard as where there were some issues or unresolved personal family dynamics that come in. Um, that's part one. 
part two, it could be that it interferes on a lesson that we're still here trying to learn. I mean, I've got a number of people in my family that I've never heard from, and I do this. Like, I find it like fascinating that, you know, like certain people don't show up. And then there's the subtlety of the reality of the work. And this is one of the things that I try to put out publicly as best as I possibly can. People in my field will make the connections that we make so much bigger and more powerful than they actually are that it's next to impossible for a lay person who doesn't do this professionally to recognize the reality and how subtle the work actually is. So when you're doing something for a really long period of time, you guys would never in a million years stop to think about how to put an IV in. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, right. you just do it. It's what, it's what you right. do. But for somebody who's never, ever done that, for somebody who would have to do that for the first time and maybe read a book on how to put an IV in, it is a very uncomfortable journey and they don't know what they're doing, right? So the more than likely if they had to do it, they're going to miss and they're not going to be able to successfully do that. So I kind of feel like that, you know, like when, Mm -hmm. when people are watching mediums work, Mediums will come sometimes and under, I can't say this without sounding like arrogant, but somebody who's not coming from the right Go ethics and responsibility of, yeah. of teaching, who's making it about them, they don't take the time to explain to people, listen, I've been doing this work for a really long time. I always will tell people how long I'm doing it because I want them to understand I've been doing this a long time. So when you hear me say these things and do these things, I've got the experience behind it. But with that experience, I bring an ethic and responsibility of teaching. And I always want people to recognize that you can have three sisters in the same family, lose the same dad, have amazing relationships with them. And dad may come through differently to all three sisters. And just because one gets Mm -hmm. a dream and somebody else gets the song on the radio and somebody else finds pennies, that doesn't mean dad loves the one and the dream any more than the other. But when somebody has a profound moment like a dream, it always feels like, oh my, that's way more of a connection than somebody getting the song lyrics or the scent or smell or seeing 1111, or having the connection to the Cardinal, or all the ABCs of connection that can take place. So they do come through. We just sometimes are so used to expecting it to be one way that we miss yeah. the subtlety of the other ways that it actually happens. That makes sense. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't make it a lot easier, but it makes sense. <laughs> right. And that's I, the, I that's appreciate the real, that. Yeah, that's the, that's the, real, the real answer. Or I, I've had readings where I have 10 people on a Zoom group, and let's say two or three of the people are related that are on there and their loved ones come through and they bring through family dynamics. And inherently at the end of the night, one of the people will say, well, is there anything for me? Because they didn't talk to me. They didn't say anything to me. Right. And I'm like, they kind of did. And they go, no, no, they talked about this and they talked about that and they validated that it was them, but they didn't say anything to me personally. And years ago, I would always take that as like, oh, 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 I don't know, I have to juggle or I have to do something else. Like, what do I do to, and then I'd be like, no, now, now it is as much for you as it is hearing. And that is to let you know that there's a survival of consciousness, life, life and love are eternal, and they're still with you. And that is what's for you in this classroom of life. How great to know that they're just in the hallway, checking in from us from time to time while we're taking our life tests. It is amazing. I like that analogy. I, I just want to tell him this quickly. Yesterday, I, was, I told Erica this, and I, without giving up, you know, information about whatnot, but I did write down, like, some stuff <clears throat> that if you did say, it would mean a lot to me. I wrote it down, and um, I was watching one of your videos yesterday, and as I wrote that down, you were saying in one of your videos that you were reading somebody, you were saying exactly what I wrote down right after I freaking right. wrote it down which was nuts. I'm like, how is that possible? Like, how did I just write that down? And I was watching one and you said it. And I'm like, is it coincidence or is that? Nope. That is, that is their way of answering your request. Now, and this is what I tell clients, anybody that's watching this, if you're going for an astrological reading, reading, if you're going for a numerology reading, if you're going for a psychic reading, if you're going for a reading with the medium, You want to do just that, Jessica. You want to write down a list of questions or things that you're curious about because what you're doing is you're projecting that out out like the bat signal in the universe for the universe to answer. 
and it just doesn't come always in the way that you had expected. Right. So b- before before there was a TV show, and before people knew what I looked like, um, I just had this really weird but cool experience where people would walk into my office and they would look at me and they would get startled, like literally startled, like visibly startled. And the first couple of times I was like, what? <laughs> and then they would follow it up with, oh my God, you were in my dream. I was like, I was wow. in your dream. Oh. And they'd wow. be like, yeah, you were, you, were, you were in my dream. So then it got to the point where my smart ass side had to like play with it. So when people would do that, I'd be like, I was in your dream. And they'd go, yes. <laughs> and I would say, I handed you a phone. And they were like, yes. I go, and you were able to talk on the phone to your relatives in your dream. And they would nod like, yes. How did you do that? And I laughed and I go, I didn't do anything. I go, your family used my face as a symbol so that when you saw me, it was a validation right. of the experience that you had directly, but they used me to be the quote unquote middleman or the medium knowing yeah. that you were going to see me. So that's Amazing. exactly what you had. Your Crazy. family just used the opportunity to get you to see a, in this case, a video, not a dream that would answer the question. And there's that no greater gift than we can give. Yep. There's no greater gift than we can give our loved ones and friends than, than not needing me. Like that is probably the most important thing I could tell people is like, nobody needs a reading, but what people need is an understanding. And with an understanding, we can work at being 50% of the equation of connecting with them. I mean, it wasn't like an hour later, like I'm telling you, I wrote it and your video was playing in the background and then you said it like you were reading somebody else, but you said exactly what it was. It was crazy. Anyway. And that happens in me. That happens to me when I'm doing my events. Like if I'm on tour and I'm actually reading for hundreds of people, I will get information for people in that room that will mirror something that's just happened in my own family. Mm-hmm. So I do yeah. the same thing. I go as a way okay. of helping you or your family. Yep. yep. As, oh, interesting. As a way of helping me. Because wow. you need that sh- too. I mean, I'm sure that you miss your mom. Like I'm sure that you need that those signs and stuff like that. You know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little OCD, so I, I need a lot of validation, right? Like when I'm, when I'm, when I'm reading, you know, somebody said to me at one of my events a few years back, I, I picked her for a question and she goes, I don't really have a question. She goes, I just have a statement. And I always brace myself when somebody right. says they have a statement. Right. Because, oh God. You, know, you never know. That, that, can, that can go either way. Right. So I was like, mm-hmm. oh, what's your statement? She goes, so you're like a needy medium. And I was like, <laughs> what? it's like. Because I don't consider myself a needy person at all. And I was like, what? She's like, well, I'm like watching you read. She goes, you force the people to come through to back up the information to make sure that it's them. She's like, don't you know that it's them? And I laughed and I go, well, I I do know that it's them. I go, but I I do like to validate in a room with a couple of hundred people that I'm with the right person. So I said, yeah. I go, okay, call me a needy medium. I'm a needy medium. (laughs) That's hilarious. You should have a t-shirt that says that. (laughs) Yeah. Needy medium. John, I'm curious. Um, do you believe in karma? Do you think karma is real? <laughs> I, it's I something do. I oh. struggle with because I've, in my life personally, there have been so many people that, you know, should have been the victim of some karma, let's just say, and seem to not only never be on the receiving end of any bad karma, but to almost be rewarded with um, these great lives. And I I know, you know, it's perception. You don't always know what people are going through, but it seems to be a reoccurring theme for me. So do you have any insight into that? I can tell you that in the years of doing this, I have watched people in my field do things and have what would be perceived success in their arenas and whatever their fields are and go, I don't get it. Like, why aren't they getting <laughs> yeah. slammed? Like, right. Me that too. Doesn't, like, make, that doesn't make sense. Like from a universal standpoint, like that's wrong. And that should be like, they should be held accountable for that. And I had, again, another British medium, this guy, Robert Brown say to me, and he just looked at me and he said, you never know how karma will actually reveal itself for the person. And it may not always happen on your timeline. Yeah. And I said, true. 
okay, but I have a Scorpio rising. Like, I want to see it. Like, I want to, I want to, I want to like, I want to like know that it's happening. Me too. Somebody else said, you know, recently said to me, yeah, they were like, wow, you're spiritual, but you're petty. I'm like, I'm not petty. I was like, I'm just <laughs> I <love> honest. That. <laughs> you know, but if you see, if you see somebody doing something that you know is like not correct and not okay, one would wonder, well, why are they being allowed to continue to do that from a universal right. standpoint? And um, I do believe that there's a bigger picture. And I do believe that people will be held accountable. I do believe that. And I do believe that it happens in a way where the most impact of that accountability happens. And sometimes the, the, the long leash that they're on for that is what we would perceive as being successful. But on a personal level, I can also say that some of those people have had some of the greatest falls in the years of me watching it. You know, here's a little old me over here four decades later just being like lone wolf, just doing my thing over here. So I always tell people never get concerned or overwhelmed by somebody else's perceived what they deserve. Because if we do that, like, here's my phrase. My phrase is this. May they get what they deserve and may I be around to learn about it. That is my yes. phrase. Ooh, because if they deserve I'm stealing if they that. deserve to if they if they deserve to win the lottery, well guess what? Let them let them freaking win. Um but let them get them let them get what they deserve, you know? So I know that on TikTok a few years back there was like a phrase that was going around where people would be like, have the day you deserve. And I'd be like, yeah. the day. I'd be yeah. like, no, have the life you de- have the life you deserve. Oh, like that's even better. You, yeah, because yeah. you know, if you're putting that out there, but the reality is those people already are on some levels. It's we just have a hard time looking at from the outside, why would somebody not hold that behavior accountable? And exactly. you can look at it in any field. I, I worked at a deli before I did anything else. And I remember like, I worked my tail off. I was 13 years old and became the night manager of a deli. Oh, you know, wow. like I wasn't even like, yeah, like I, I've been always like a hard worker. And I never understood why this one person who had the deli experience, who was there, who was like the golden boy of the, of the building. Like, you know, I did all the, the grunt work. Like I was doing all the stuff that, he never had to do anything. Now, I, I would sit back and be like, what is, like, why is this happening? Like, why? Yeah. And this is a long time ago. And you could see, I could, like, I could still put myself in the mindset right. of going, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm doing all of this. And he's just like sitting there in the back having coffee with the guy and getting paid. And like, getting why all is, the credit. Why aren't, you're like, but why aren't they letting him come out and do this? And I just right. sat back and was like, all right, it is what it is, you know, let, live and learn. And I did. I learned from that job. I learned from working in the video store. I learned from w- w- working in the hospital. I learned that it didn't matter that I was working in the hospital, you know, which to me was very, very prestigious. And they were trying to, you know, you know, do whatever they could to be the best place that they possibly could be. But within that, there are humans. And humans make egotistical human judgments based upon in some cases, their budget or their time off or their, their whatevers. So we have to just look at everything as where's the lesson? What am I supposed to learn from this? Because if you learn the lesson, then you can make choices to make sure that you don't have to be taking the test to relearn that lesson again. Yeah. Uh, you uh, you uh, mentioned geez, holding people accountable, <laughs> which, which just made me wonder how do you reconcile religion? I, I know I didn't realize that you were raised particularly religious until Jessica was telling me, um, was it something that he said in school? Wait, I wrote it down. He's a recovering Catholic. <laughs> I'm a recovering yeah. Catholic. And I wrote a book on the rosary too. Um, I wrote a book called practical praying because I felt like I was excommunicated from the church. And then, you know, the universe puts us in these amazing opportunities. When I was taking my, my, you know, I was in the healthcare world at the program that I was in, I was, lo- I was looking at the courses that you could take for electives. And one of the courses that they offered was witchcraft oh, wow. and other blah, 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 blah. And it was offered to only seniors. And I'm like, well, how do I not take that class? Like, it's like I have to, like, I have to get in that class. Right. So I told, I, I told my counsel, I was like, I need to get in this class. And she said, no, it's for upperclassmen. And then I read her and she got me in the class. And <laughs> And, and, and then I, I sat in that <laughs> class and the teacher walked in and he said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to theology 101. And I was like, theology. It's like, I barely wanted to go to CCD. Like I would never have taken theology. Like, what am I sitting in? Theolo- I'm in the wrong room. Everybody right. felt like they were in the wrong room. 
At which point the professor said, listen, you should have continued reading what the course description was. It was like witchcraft and other theological pursuits, but nobody oh, got wow. past witchcraft. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, had, I took an entire semester on switch. the religions oh. of the world. Yep. Total, <laughs> total um, eye opener for me because, you know, nobody taught me in life about like Christianity and the amount of people that and bloodshed and wars that had taken place over the divine and God. You know, that's not what they would teach you. So that, that part was swept under the rug. Or the fact that reincarnation, reincarnation was at one point part of Christianity, and then man took that out as a doctrine of a belief. Because if they think you can come back and do this again, well, therefore, you know, we can't control you in this lifetime. Or John Calvin and Calvinism and the 99 whatever's and the Protestant Reformation, Like all of that stuff was eye-opening for me, but important because it gave me a perspective from other people's perspectives coming at religion and how can they understand, justify, and rectify their belief system. So I came to the place where I said, listen, my job is to paint a portrait of energy. That's all I'm doing. How you frame that portrait in your house on your wall, that's on you. I'm not giving you a belief system. I just want to let you know that outside of this physical body, we exist. There's a survival of love and where there's love, there's connection. Absolutely. I almost feel like the rosary is like, I mean, I, I grew up praying the rosary. I mean, that's just, you do, when you're Catholic, you do it. Our, our father well, I, th- but I think to me, you the have rosary one there with like, you don't you oh, yes I do I, yeah I told Erica <laughs> that earlier um but to me it's more like a meditation like if I really it's exactly. it's just something to it's something repetitive and it puts you like in a zone you know what I mean so like I'm kind of the same I think um uh, thoughts that you are like Catholicism is so strict growing up Catholic and you know the masses and uh, I mean I think you had to go to mass like daily for a while I, I think I heard you say that yeah I'm like oh my <laughs> the god look so on your grade. face when you're like oh <laughs> yeah oh gosh um I personally don't go to mass anymore um you know I don't Same. yeah I, I I obviously I still believe in in a higher power um I still will pray my rosary but I do it in a different way now it's not because you have to or you're going to go to hell it's because um yep. It, it connects me a with my loved ones that have passed that really, you know, have a fond uh, admiration for the rosary. But it it also just like it just puts me in a peaceful peaceful place sometimes. It's the only way I can. So describe one it. of the things, that, one of the reasons why I actually wrote a book on the rosary is my publisher at the time um, had me on tour in Australia, and I was getting it was early in the morning and I was up and I got this like download of information that I needed to write a book about the rosary. And I just literally sat there out loud and went, no, I'm not doing that. Like, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, like, that's not happening. And the reason why is I had spent such quality time putting distance between me and any type of religion that I didn't want anybody to feel alienated. If mm-hmm. they weren't Catholic, they couldn't connect with their loved ones, right? Because it right. doesn't really matter what your denomination you are or lack of a denomination. You can still make a connection with energy. So my publisher called me maybe about a half hour later and said, um, can I come down to your room? I want to talk to you about your next book. And I was like, sure. Not even remotely thinking that he was going to say anything that I had just gotten in this like two second download. And he literally said, I think you should write a book on the rosary. I legit levitated out of my chair, like out wow. of like, what? Like, yeah, where did it that was such a, from? yeah, it was like, like, it was like, he hit me in the face with it. And I was like, Whoa. And I had to, I had to sit with that because now I was getting the validation of the mm-hmm. message. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. I go, but can I ask you why? And he says, well, what do you do before you read? I said, well, I, I pray. He goes, well, what kind of prayer? And I go, well, I for years have prayed the rosary, but not like with the original intent, but with the intent of the repetition of prayer helps to raise vibration and it's mm-hmm. more affirmative. He goes, well, then just write it from that perspective. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll think about it. And then about That's crazy. I, I have say, never even read that book. I didn't even yeah. I mean I knew you had that book, but I didn't know what it was about. I haven't read it. But that's crazy that yeah. I'd say that. And that's essentially I'm guessing what your book is about. <laughs> and then two weeks two weeks later, after that trip, a friend of mine who's a priest called me and he said, uh, yeah, I got a message in, in, in prayer this morning. And I went, What's what's the message? And he goes, Write the darn book. Oh boy. <laughs> You're like, okay. And- And I just literally (laughs) said to him, I go, what book? And he goes, the book on the rosary. 
And again, I about jumped out of my body because wow. he wasn't a part of any of these conversations. Like I would never say right. to my friend who's a Catholic, the Catholic priest friend, hey, I'm thinking about writing a book on the rosary. Right. You know, like it wasn't going to, wasn't going to happen. And then I, and I, and I did it and I, I wrote it um, to express how I utilized it. And really, ultimately, save yourself the trouble. The reality of it is it's just about repetitive affirmations and setting positive intentions. It's, and I honestly your focus have on never something. even looked at what that book is about. Like, and I didn't realize I used the rosary in the, in the same way. That's nuts. Guess what book Jessica's going to buy next? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Seriously, <laughs> I know. I'm like, I have to read this now. I didn't even realize I was I was doing that. Like, I I don't know. I think I think some people are more. Um, a kin or more in tune to wanting to raise their frequencies versus other people just aren't open to it. You know, like if I, right. I've always felt not that I'm a medium in any way, but I, right. I've always felt like I like with taking on people's energy and, and feelings and stuff. But I, I'm like, why do all these little coincidences and weird things happen to me? And then when I relay it to other people, they think I'm crazy. I'm like, is it because, I'm just more open to it. Like, do you think that that's some people just have more of a, a belief system? Like with you going on tour, I take it, you know, right now you're on tour. I know you're going to New Jersey. Um, I think you're like, where am I going? Um, next, next week. And then Australia. <laughs> I, I was like, I did about two seconds. I was like, where am I going? <laughs> yeah. You have two shows in New Jersey, by the way, I could be your assistant. Um, and, and then to, and then to Australia. But do you ever get people that you'll read them, but they're just shut down? Like, you try to give them messages that are coming through, but they just, they don't want to validate it because either A, they're not open to what you're saying or, or B, they're just so skeptical that they can't even hear the message or hear what's coming through. Does, does that make so sense that sound, what I'm asking? <laughs> that is so spot on for the week, the last week that I just had in, in mm. one of the events that I just did. Um, there's a lot of energy that you have to actually sometimes break through in order to get somebody to pay attention. So if, if somebody's coming for a reading, and this is an old story, but I had a waiting list that was like over eight years long at one point, and this woman wow. was on it. And when she finally got in front of me, she sat in front of me. And it was like 6 30, 7 o'clock at night. I gave her a pass because it could have been traffic. It could have been she didn't know where she was coming from. You know, she had traveled in for it. And there was a lot of puffing and puffing and angst and frazzled energy. And and I sat down, and I said, you are you okay? And she said, yeah, I'm fine. I was like, okay. Her energy was not fine. Oh boy. And then I gave her my, my, I gave her my big speech and then I started giving information and like Wonder Woman with the bullet bracelets, you know, it was like my words were the bullets and she was like, ching, 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 ching. <laughs> and then I finally just looked at her and I said, well, I think we're done here. And all of a sudden she said, wait, wait, what? And I went, yeah, I said, I think, I think we're done. I don't think I'm the right person for you. And she said, I've waited seven years for this. And I literally looked at him and I was like, well, then you should act like you waited seven years for this. Right. And she like yeah. looked at me and I said, no, I'm serious. Like you should act like you waited seven years. You're acting like I'm the reason why your loved ones passed. You're coming mm. at me with energy as opposed to allowing me to facilitate it. And mm. then she dropped her guard and she had a great session. But there were, there were those moments. And then there were moments where I think – the details or the specifics that I can come through with make people very myopic and they get very annoyed by the fact that they're not hearing the, what I call the fluffy stuff, you know, mm -hmm. Oh, they love you and they're sitting with you and they're smiling yeah. and they're happy. And you right. know, when you see a, when you see a butterfly, that's them. And they know that they're like, a lot of people just want that. And I, I have to say like, I am not the right person for you. Like, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't care if people like me, but you're going to listen. The message is often just that they are there, that their loved one is still there. And then they just give you some way to validate that to them. But there is no other right. touchy-feely. Well, no, the touchy-feely is the fact that they're there. Like the yeah. connection and the love is to re reinforce that. But like, I don't ever want to foster a dependency on me or the subject matter. I want to inspire somebody to recognize that they that they that they know that there's an afterlife, that they know there's a place that their loved ones and friends go, that we will be reunited again, and how how great to know that we can have that connection. The problem comes in is people 
want what they want. And we live in a, you know, fast food society, like where you want to pull up to the drive through window and order the number two and supersize that with grandma. That's not how this works, <laughs> right? It's, it's not going to happen like that. It happens in the way that yeah. it needs to with facts and information, not always emotion. But, you know, you guys are on TikTok. You guys see what's on there. If you see psychics on there, watch the level of BS that you will yes. see. You, know, yeah. you can't have a thousand people in a, in a live and go, does somebody here know John? Right. It's like, you, you, you know. Right. It's, yeah, uh, someone's going to know it's, John. Yeah. Has anyone had right. somebody pass in September? Any, anybody? <laughs> right? Not for a room like, for uh, 10,000 people. No. So like when I'm reading for somebody, like I, I will tell them right up, right up front, like, here are the things I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about your cardinals, your butterflies, your hummingbirds, finding pennies, dimes and quarters, seeing 11, 11, 2, 2, 2. I go through the litany of all the things that are real. Yeah. But you yeah. don't need me for that. You need me to take it to the next level. Let's, let's get into what's, what's the lesson that you're supposed to be learning that maybe your loved ones and friend want to come through talking about. Like what's the, it's not always what people want, but I think yeah. it's always what they need. Working in hospice and in particular Peds Hospice. Sure. I've always been curious uh, when a child, a young child passes and they are still there, their energy with their parents or their family, do they stay at that maturity level forever? You know, that's a, I love that question. So you actually are, you're, yes, because you're diving into an energy that's very different than what people would ask normally. Normally, they would say, are they the same age? So if somebody passed at the age of 10, and it's 10 years later, and they get read, that child can come through as a 10-year-old, or that child can come through as a 20-year-old oh, and, yeah. and age them on a calendar. Interesting. But the beauty of hospice, the wonder of hospice and palliative care, my mom was a recipient of that, so I have firsthand experience with that world and what that was like. Um, and the level of what I think angels on earth helping people to labor to leave. And I always say to folks, we labor to come into this world. We labor to leave. And there's a lot of similarities in ways that people don't see. You know, when you're in utero, you have nine months of being nurtured and taken care of in a warm, loving environment. But then something traumatic happens to you in that environment where you are forced to evacuate an environment that you're nurtured and loving, love, loved in. You usually go through a tunnel birth canal, you're met by a bright white light and received by family that's very excited to see you. Well, death is just like that. We are in a world where we're nurtured and we're loved. And then at a certain point, we're going to labor to leave where we also go through a tunnel. And that tunnel is the soul leaving the body where we meet up with loved ones and friends who are very excited to see us again. So wow. birth and death have a very similar transformative place from being safe to feeling unsafe, to feeling loved. But when that energy passes, it's passing and being met by those who've gone on before them, which is also for folks that are listening to this, if you were not able to be at the bedside with someone when they passes, if somebody passed and they passed during COVID where you weren't allowed to be at the bedside, right. or if yeah. you come from a toxic family where they kept you from your loved one, yeah. please know that nobody ever passes alone and nobody is ever alone when they're transitioning. Even if nobody's in the room physically with them, there are always loved ones and friends that are kind of cheering them on, like they're on the side of the road, you know, doing the final run of the, the, the race, that. like they're there to, to be there and celebrate with them. So never feel like, oh my God, I wasn't there. I mean, honor the I wasn't there from an earthly grief standpoint, right. but know from an energetic standpoint, they're, they're never going to come back and be like, where the hell were you? I waited for <laughs> two and a half days, you know, and then I had to go. They don't, they don't really come through with that. They come through with appreciation, gratitude, and love. Do well, you, you know, in hospice. Though, that they know it's oh, better, though. Like, they know it's the, the, patient, the person dying knows it would be better for my child to not see me. So a lot of times, maybe yeah. they will we themselves. see that all the time yeah, in hospice. To die at, all a, the time. at a time that their oh, yeah. family isn't there or is there, vice versa, you know? Yeah, I, I call that making it a run for it. Right. And I tell my <laughs> clients all the time, I'm like, if you talk to anybody that's in critical care work, mm -hmm, anybody that's yeah. critical, ICU, CCU, yep. um, you know, med surge step down where there's like a critical recovery period or hospice or palliative care, there's like an unspoken code, which is 
hey, why, why don't you go stretch your legs? Why don't why, you go get some coffee? Why don't you go coffee? grab a coffee? Yeah. Why don't you get, go get some coffee? Because that gives the person who's going to be transitioning the opportunity and space to actually pass because mm -hmm. they may not be able to pass when the unspoken energy is going, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. Yeah. Please don't leave me. Please don't go. Please don't leave me. Please don't right. leave me. So. And then we see the opposite where they will defy uh, medical odds and just hang on for seemingly yeah. long periods of time until someone important arrives that they're waiting yep. for. We and see then that. Finally go. Yeah. And then, and then finally, very finally quickly. Go. Yeah. It's amazing. But we see that all the time in hospice. Yeah. So John, you recently what? came out with a new app, I'm told. Can you yeah, tell us a little bit about the Evolve Plus TV app? So the Evolve Plus TV, it's Evolve P L U S dot TV. It is a place, it is a community where people can create their own profile. And then we have different groups and channels. So there's a group called circles that's informative i have my own channel and a group that's there so i'll go live and do readings there um and then we have a group called the journey that's head up by a woman named diane gray and she is a death doula and she deals with a lot of oh, wow. grief and on death and dying uh on her live streams that she does there and then we have a channel called the orbit and a group that matches it where we have a weekly cosmic a podcast on the astrological weather. So every week there's an astrologer that's doing a podcast named Lisa Salvatore. My daughter, Olivia hosts that because she understands astrology. So they have this okay, weekly cool. thing that they do, but we have um, astrologers, numerologists, we're doing meditation and it's, it's, it's growing exponentially. So we're excited about 2024 and, and what we're doing with that. But I wanted to create a safe space for the subject matter where people would not be scammed by all the knockoffs that are out there like all the hundred i have like over 150 john edward accounts on tiktok that are yeah, not me it's ridiculous they, they clone they clone the content um you know same thing with instagram so i'm not a fan i i used to love twitter for entertainment fun you know reasons um i don't i'm not on twitter or x i call it twix now twix i'm not on, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really on i'm not on twix <laughs> Um, Instagram, I don't really, really go on, uh, TikTok, I will do because I like, yeah, I, like, I see you on there, right? Yes. Yep. We met via TikTok and, uh, and the only reason why I actually went on TikTok was because I saw a woman doing a live and I thought it was a parody. I legitimately oh my thought gosh. this was like a skit making fun of the subject matter oh, and then realized uh, another that psychic? she was serious. Or trying we'll to be. Her, we'll call her that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be? call her that. Wow. But I remember uh, it was like two o'clock in the morning. I was like, I, this woman's going to make me get out of bed right now and turn the camera on me. <laughs> like it was, it was that bad. It was really, really bad. Well, we appreciate yeah, that you're on TikTok. You should have joined her live. Yeah. Oh, yeah, can you imagine as another yeah, psychic medium having. Yeah, you imagine him popping having... in? <laughs> Hi, it's me, John. Let me, show you, how, in. Let me show you how it really goes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wait, wait. this is BS. Like this woman's totally full of it. You guys should just not be here. Like, get get off. <laughs> are, do you, do you have opinions that you would be willing to share about other well known psychics? Maybe some that you have good, uh, great respect for. Sure. Or is, I, or is that a taboo a, I, subject? <laughs> I I will tell you who I, I I respect in the field. I respect a woman by the name of Shar Margolis because she's been doing this for a very 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 long time. Um, Robert Brown is a person that I talked about from, from London. I have a great respect for him. Um, and respect and acknowledging someone's abilities are two different things. There are people that I know are really good at what they do, but I don't respect them because of how they yeah. choose to use it. I guess so. Okay. There's, there's differences that, that come up there. Um, I think one of the, one of the people that have been one of the most clearest instruments doing this work is a gentleman by the name of George Anderson. Um, and then there's Jonathan Lewis, who's also on, on TikTok, who I helped mentor. So like clearly him, um, oh, that's there's, one there's I need to people. follow and in, 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 in different fields, there are different people. So different modalities. So what I've done is the people that I resonate with, I've invited them to become verified creators on the Evolve Plus TV app okay. so that 
folks when I go, this is who I would recommend. I just go, just go to the, go to the creator's so channel, go to the creator's channel and just pick who you feel like you're, you're resonating with. So yeah. Yeah. Cause I've, I've been doing this for so long that like I've met people that I go, you're really good, but you know, I don't I really like how they're doing it. And that's just a me thing. It's, you know, yeah. some people would say there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. Right. But I don't think it's, a, I, I don't think certain things are okay. Because I have, again, I have an old school mentality when it comes to yeah. how do we treat the client? I get that as a nurse. There are, there are nurses that other, that patients and families think are amazing. And I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> you know, um, well, but that's somebody's your area amazing of person. Right. But somebody's amazing personality is one thing. Right. But that personality might translate to being technically trained correctly. Correct. Yeah. They, they tend to love the cheerleaders, the very happy, peppy nurses and nothing wrong with that, but that's not really the goal. You know, the goal is safe right. patient care and the ability to advocate and get you what you need. Right. But right. don't even get me started on that. Yeah. That's a whole nother <laughs> podcast. Um, if they wanted to yeah. find you on tour, they could go to your website, correct? Which is John Edward.net to see what tour dates you have correct. coming up and, Correct. Um, and I really recommend like going to a live show. I, I've been to one and it was a phenomenal experience. So well, if you're thinking you. about going, please, please do. Yeah. And I then wanna, where I do they check find your app? Just in the app store, I imagine? Yeah. They can go to evolveplus.tv and um, you'll see the logo. It looks like this. So it's like a, a cookie. A cookie? Put a bite out of it. Like a Saturn yeah, a cookie. cookie? It is a Saturn cookie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the meaning of that? So the first TV show that I did was called Crossing Over. And when it debuted, it debuted in the Sci-Fi Channel. And the Sci-Fi yes, Channel's logo I was Saturn. And oh, yeah. I happen to uh-huh. love, yep, I happen to love chocolate chip cookies. So I thought, I'm going to blend both my worlds, the cookie and the Saturn. And this is like a new media like opportunity because I get a chance to go live on here. And when we do the Jersey events, we're actually filming them as TV shows. So oh, we're going cool. to create shows that'll air on evolve plus and plus there's there's like a, a i'm i'm going after all of my books and the rights to my products again and that is going to be also an added value so when people go to my channel there's like a there's a psychic development workshop that's being released episodically that's like they were coming up on the fourth lesson but all of that together was like a 1200 dollars value it's on there part of the membership i'm getting my books back you know all of those add up. That's going to be on the. I, okay. I'm creating a, a a hub of where all my products can exist. Yeah. So I'm going after the one by one because it's such a it's such a weird world out there, and people would look for like a, a book I wrote on development called Infinite Quest, but they were selling it on Amazon for like two hundred dollars a copy. So it's either like you can't get the book and it's two hundred two hundred dollars a copy on Amazon, or there are books that were being sold for a quarter in like some other place i'm like oh my god okay, this is just crazy yeah like because because i don't have a tv show so i'm not out there in the way media wise like i i once was so it's now a good time for me to pull those children home they're coming home and they're living on the app well you have such a vast uh array of experience with, with your lifetime of doing this that it would be hard to get it all organized like that so i think i think this is going to be great for you uh yeah, you mentioned I, oh go ahead. go ahead sorry uh you mentioned your daughter earlier and i just wanted to say i, I think you must be such a proud uh father because i was did i hear that she was going into the uh acting world and your son in was it. in the medical world yeah my my son is a first year med student. I wow. knew it. Yeah, I told you, Erica. Yeah. 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 He's a first year med student. And Amazing. He, uh, he's actually working at the hospital that I used to work at. So it's really kind of kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's doing that. He's working in, as they now call it, the ED, which I can't get used to. I just I know. my brain. I know. Right. My brain. It's, it's still the ER. Yeah. Right. The ER in my head. Um, yeah. Because ED has a whole different connotation to me. So. <laughs> Right, right. That's the ED like, that we know about. When somebody said to me that they worked in the ED, I was like, "That's You're a like department they, now." Yeah, they have a whole department. That's a whole dedicated? department. For that? It's a whole specialty. It's a pandemic now. <laughs> Everybody's falling down, literally. I believe that would be a peendemic. 
Um, oh my gosh. The jokes are getting better and better. <laughs> oh my God, I, love that's great. I love healthcare humor. That's the that's that's a given. Well, we so. well it's sick and humor. twisted, you know, yeah. and and it's not meant for the outside non medical world, right? Like only yeah. only we get it. Yeah. But it's a coping a lot mechanism. Of, a lot of people get mad at me. You know that, Erica, because the, the people that aren't in healthcare hear my uh, skits and they're like, how could you say that? That's you know, so but I'm like, hey, you're not my target audience, honey. <laughs> I know, but people, people like to be offended. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's they true. They like to be offended. Yeah. Erica pisses everybody off, don't you, Erica? I, I do. She's <laughs> making a t-shirt saying it's Nurse Erica's fault because everything gets yeah, blamed Yeah, everyone always me. blames her. In nursing, <laughs> they just blame Erica. Anything yeah. that it's happens fault, in Erica. nursing, it's my fault. Yeah. Frustrating as all Pre- that. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Well, well, just remember, every field has, e- every field has ego, so. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, and it's That's definitely sure. in the medical field, for sure. That's Any um, upcoming predictions for healthcare other than what you had said at oh, the beginning yeah, of 2023 it. any advice for nurses anything along those lines because you know we're still struggling i i i just think the same thing that i said earlier you know i think that people have to recognize the 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 backbone of a healthcare industry is nursing like yeah thank you I, I, I've, I've seen it firsthand. Like I've watched it and witnessed it firsthand, like what they do and how they do what they do. And, and, and doctors are amazing and they spend quality time doing what they do, but the facilitators of those orders and those needs and the catching of the mistakes, all of that, that goes into giving those doctors, those, that respect. I've been in the rooms, I've watched it happen, mm-hmm. you know, where somebody says, um, you know, excuse me, so-and-so, you know, but, did you mean this or this? You know, mm-hmm. and the patient would the patient wouldn't know that, right? But you know, when the doctor's like, "Oh yes, 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 that," uh-huh. you know, and they've got four thousand patients of themselves that they have to go through. I feel bad for doctors in a whole different other field because medicine has been so corporatized that I guess it has. You know, having a having a doctor actually spend quality time with a patient is unheard of because mm-hmm. they're giving you you know two point. Yeah, two point eleven seconds in order to do your HNP with the person. So how are you really getting into, you know, history and physical for those that don't know what that is? But like, yeah. how are you getting into how are you getting into a patient's actual issues? Right. So it's it's just really it's it's an interesting time when it comes to health. But yet, you know, telehealth clinics are popping up everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, everywhere, yes. And I'm like, like I'm not so comfortable with with that like no how do you build up a trust and a relationship with someone well and how do you really examine someone you know yeah some things are okay you can report your symptoms but how are you looking in someone's throat how are you looking in someone's ear you know you're just going to prescribe something based off my list of symptoms without actually examining me it's so strange yeah. Yeah and, I'm, yeah. and I'm still the person that's out here, you know, with mitigating COVID precautions. Like when I walk onto stage, the only time that people will see me not being what would be perceived as being safe would be me on stage. Me on stage, I'm legitimately like, I walk out with a mask because I want people to see me wearing it. Mm-hmm. I put the mask, I take the mask off on stage. And then, by the way, on the stage, there are actually three filters that are happening with a CO2 monitor on every nice. stage that I'm actually. Nice. Uh, actually sp- speaking in front of. Um, and then I use Enovid spray before and after my, my actual wow. events. Good and for I you. And I'm still double masking on planes. And I, I am I, too. I want- and I feel like I'm the only one. I've been traveling quite a bit lately. And I'm one of maybe two people on a plane wearing a mask. It's so frustrating. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, I always go back to like this one image that I was shown at the very beginning of the pandemic. And that was coming out of a restaurant in Manhattan and about 16, 20 feet in front of us was somebody who was vaping. And that vape cloud was pretty, pretty big. And when it blew back, it blew back towards us Mm. and we had just eaten dinner. And I was like, I'm like, ew, I can taste, I can taste great. Which Uh, meant that like, I feel like not to be gross guys, but like, I feel like I just like licked his lung. That, That image never left my mind yeah. because that's what they showed me COVID was. They yeah. equated COVID mm. right from day one to a vape cloud. So when everybody was like, it's, it's not airborne, it's not airborne. I had everybody oh. around me. I'm like, this shit is airborne. Absolutely. Wear your freaking mask. You know, like yeah. wear your mask. 
but I'm, I'm all, I practice universal precautions when I worked in healthcare. I practice universal metaphysical precautions in everyday life. I so I'm always going to protect my, my, my energetic self as well as my physical self. So before there was a pandemic, Absolutely. you know, I was the Lysol wipe guy cleaning the plane because people are nasty. Like, Me and those too. Are nasty. And they don't yeah. clean those planes the way they should. Mm -mm. They're turning they over. Don't. They're turning like them over so minutes. fast. No, they do not. And There's now you like get on planes and you everywhere. see trash Ooh. left from the previous, like they're not cleaning. Come on. They're not disinfecting. No, I know. So, it, it's so gross. We have to be our own patient advocate. And that's for everything. We have to be our own patient advocate. If we're in the hospital, we have to be our own patient advocate when it comes to your own, you know, health. You know, I, I'm, I'm of the mindset. And I know that I'm coming from a place of I worked in a hospital. So when somebody had to have their blood, you know, drawn and they were being trained, we would have our bloods done and we would have baseline testing. But I got used to that. And I got used to the fact that having baselines are really, really important. So whether I have a baseline of my blood work or I went for a pre novo scan in January of this year to do a full body MRI, I think it's important for us cool. to, have, to, know, to know ourselves, like know, know your body. And don't let the fear of what may be something mm -hmm. stop you from finding out what that is. Yeah. So I think being your own patient advocate in the world that we're still living in is you need to mitigate when it comes to COVID. And so many people want things to go back to normal and they're just not going to until people take their, that part of their health seriously. Yeah, well I agree. Said. I yeah. agree. Thank you so much, John. No, thank, thank you, you. for Thanks taking for the me. time to meet with us today and for imparting not just your, your abilities, but your wisdom with us. We, we truly appreciate it. And Jessica, you got to come to an event. Let me know what area you're in. Yeah. You know, I would come on. love to. I would absolutely love She's to. She's in Florida. I'm, yeah, I'm in Florida. So uh, I don't know if you Next have Next time been. I'm there. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'll Any more Vegas you... shows on the horizon? No, I haven't, I haven't been there in a while. I, I was just invited, though, to come back. So I think that that's going to, that eventually will happen. I'm, I have to find out where that'll be, though. Uncertain Please yet. let me you, know if you do. You do a I lot will. of Australia there. stuff, don't you? Like, you do. It seems like it. A lot. I do. I do. Is it I do that a lot you just of like it, or is it just both? Okay. Yeah, I like. I like it, and they're pretty amazing. Oh. It's a pretty Your amazing accents country. Accents are amazing. I love. <laughs> I love an Australian <laughs> accent. I will. I will leave you guys with this. Every year that I went there, I always wanted to be there at the end of the year because when I came back, it was hard to read. It was hard to read in the states. Because the level of community that they have as a country is really awesome to feel. Oh, and I'll wow. leave you with this. I woke up once and I was there and somebody in Perth, which is like the California, Australia, I was in Sydney, said, hey, mate, I know I'm not going to be able to get to see you in Perth. I know you're going to be in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Perth this year. Have a great tour. And I'm like, wow, that's so nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, <laughs> they, like they... They cared that I was actually in the country. And I think that they care about everybody in the same kind of way. So I think it's nice. nice. Because if you too is, you know, performing in Miami, nobody in Seattle cares. Like nobody in Seattle cares if they're performing right. in Miami. They're going right. to care when they're coming closer to where, where they are. So I yeah. think that's kind of cool. It's a good bunch of people. I have never awesome. been. It's on my bucket guys. list. Thank you, Thank John. You Thank you so much. We appreciate you. you. Keep we'll doing your soon. good work. Talk soon. Thank you. Right, guys. Bye. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,